Well, welcome once again to Graceway Baptist Church and our Sunday School lesson. We are looking at the lesson to be presented on, um, let's see, September 22nd of 2024. And uh, we are well into fall. The weather has been great lately, if you haven't noticed. But uh, as we record this, we're getting ready to come into a little bit of heat. But uh, things will change and things will cool off and before long, we'll be in the holiday season, so um, looking forward to it. And we're in football season and all of those kind of things now. And so uh, we praise God for another year of life and that He is the one that has sustained us to this particular point. And we're here for a reason. We're here for a purpose. And so our Sunday school lesson um, is entitled here, uh, Don't Doubt God. And that is something that we constantly have to battle, constantly have to face. And it's more than just um, positive thinking or wishful thinking or a good outlook or anything. We ought to have those, especially as believers. But we also ought to be keenly aware of uh, things we talked about in last week's lessons, like obvious providence. And when we think about all of the things that go on every day in the world that are necessary for life, the rising and the setting of the sun, meaning the earth is rotating as it should, uh, that's necessary for life. And uh, we take that so for granted, we rarely ever thank God for anything like that. Think about uh, all of the things that have to be in place for you to have air to breathe like uh, we're breathing now. Think about how wonderful it is, all of the little things that God does. And He does that on the basis of His Word. He's promised to provide for all of our needs according to His riches and glory. And certainly that's talking about salvation, uh, acceptance in Christ, the love of God, heaven, the promise of heaven, the promise of Christ's return, all of those kind of things are in there too. But there are a lot of other things that we find in the Bible that God is the creator. And uh, according to the book of Colossians, he is the sustainer of the universe. And that's why we live in relative safely, uh, safety. And uh, it's why the earth stays on its course and other planets uh, stay in the course that is determined for them. Uh, it's just an amazing thing when you think about life and you think about all that God has done for us. And again, I, I mean this in, as an intentional thing, the little things as well as the big things. The Word of God is not just simply about the dramatic, the explosive, the unusual, but it's also about the everyday things. In this case, providing a bride for a young man named Isaac. So what's the big deal? People have been getting married since Adam and Eve. And what, what is happening here? Well, when we look at the situation that Eliezer is in, God has taken him from uh, the land of Canaan back to Abraham's ancestral homeland of Mesopotamia, Ur of the Chaldees. And... Uh, this guy uh, going across the desert, very few landmarks, little to navigate by, let's say, and yet he ends up at the right place. He ends up at a well where one of the people from Abraham's clan comes out to water uh, the camels and or get water, I guess, for their livestock and for their household use. He asked her for a drink and she said, yeah. And uh, while you're doing that, I'll water your camels as well, just as he had prayed. Now, with all of that, we think, what an amazing thing that the guidance, the providence of God to get him right at the right place at the right time is uh, simply amazing. But uh, as a father of two daughters, I, I know how dads think, and I know... Uh, what it's like whenever they come of age and they start bringing uh, people around that you don't necessarily want around, uh, even though I love Jeremy and Isaac, but you, you, you guys know what I mean. And uh, you want to protect your daughters and you want the best for them. Well, in this situation, a stranger comes 
and he tells this fantastic story about a master back in Canaan that you've never met, seen, or laid eyes on who just happens to be from your own clan. Well, that's kind of eye-opening. And then uh, the jewelry is brought out and put on Rebecca, and uh, Rebecca's brother and father see that, and they kind of know this is a man of means. This is not just some... Um, local yokel out here. This is somebody that is very important and very intentional. And uh, the way that Eliezer tells the story, it shows that this has moral um, backing, good intentions, honor, all of those kind of things. Well, I mean, as they said and listened to this story, this is stacking up like a dream come true. This is everything that they would want for their daughter, and in Laban's case, his sister. And uh, all of this is happening. And uh, is Eliezer just kind of, oh, okay, well, we knew God was going to do it. No big deal. No, he is amazed by all of this. We uh, think about th these two aspects when we pray or ask God for something. Should we be surprised when God does what he promises to do? Well, actually, no. He's faithful, right? But at the same time, how callous are we when we just take it for granted? Well, of course he did. That's what I asked for and that's what I demanded and that's what he did. No, there's also a side to where we should be unamazed by it because God just keeps his word. And then there's a side to where we should be absolutely blown away that the God of the universe would answer our prayer. Now, if you'll remember back to uh, when Eliezer is being sent on this mission by Abraham, Eliezer's got a little bit of a, I don't know if it's a negative streak or a little bit of realism, maybe we say, in his life because he asked Abraham, I know you're sending me on this mission, you're praying for me, and you said an angel is going to guide me, but what if she doesn't want to come? And uh, because he said that, I don't know 100%, but I'm, I'm just kind of guessing that Eliezer is still thinking as he has the camels watered and as Rebecca goes back in and tells her mom and everybody else about the man that she met. And then when Laban goes out and says, come on in, don't just stand by the well. We've got a place for you and for your camels. Come on in. And then he makes food for them. And Eliezer says, no, before I eat anything, I, I want to tell you this story. And that's what we looked at last week. But I still think that Eliezer is just a tad surprised that any of this goes well. I think he had it in the back of his mind. Yeah, we can get up to this point, but they're never going to agree to this. And this is never going to happen. This is one of the most preposterous things that I've ever seen. And I would agree with him if he were thinking like that. I would agree, especially if I were a relative or the father of Rebecca. This is crazy. This is just so unbelievable. But we find that uh, something else happened here that the family absolutely agreed with it. Let's look at our introduction. Eliezer gave a persuasive, compelling speech, and the family leaders had nothing to say. And they agreed that the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah was the will of God. So once again, we see that God is faithful to his covenant. And once again, he is the provider of the chosen bride and the covenant made to Abraham is quote unquote on track as, it, as if it would be anything else, right? And because God does not change, and being perfect, he has no need to change. We can rest in him as Abraham did. So I don't think Abraham was at home wringing his hands saying, I hope this all works out. I hope it's successful. I'm relatively sure he was confident in all of that. But Eliezer, I mean, he's the one that has to tell the story. Can you imagine going to a stranger and telling him this story? and uh, expecting them to respond positively. I mean, it's, it's just kind of crazy when you think about it from just a merely human level. But when you think about it from God's perspective and who God is, omnipresent, 
omniscient and omnipotent, then this whole thing is rigged, isn't it? Let's look in Genesis 24 and let's start reading at verse 54. And we'll just go down to verse 58 for this lesson. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. That's what they had been invited to do. Then they arose in the morning and said, Send me away to my master. Now, uh, understand here, they weren't being held hostage. They're just using good manners. This is kind of like saying at the dinner table, may I be excused before you get up and walk off. You ought to teach your children to do that. It's respectful to all of the other people at the table. And this is just uh, Eliezer's way of showing respect. You've been hospitable. You've been kind. We've come here on a mission. You've agreed to the terms of the mission and the marriage of Rebecca to Isaac. So now uh, that's their way of saying, may we be excused. Just acknowledging them. It's kind of a way of saying thank you and we appreciate everything that you've done. Just good manners. But we come to verse 55 and there's that uh, word of contrast. But her brother... And her mother said, Let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least ten. After that, she may go. So how is Eliezer going to respond to that? little reluctance. Let's, let's pull back just a little bit. And uh, maybe we were too gung-ho. Maybe we were too agreeable. A little bit of um, regret here, remorse. Verse 56 says, And he, this is Eliezer, said to them, Do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. And so they said, We will call the young woman, Rebecca, and ask her personally. They kind of think that if they get her down here, she'll probably agree to stay the 10 days, right? So then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Uh-oh, backfired. At least that's what it seems like to me. If I'm wrong, I'll apologize um, when I get to heaven. <clears throat> Number one, the servant wants to finish the mission. But notice here, this is how we have the point. He wants to finish it well. He wants to complete everything, but he doesn't want to go back empty-handed. He doesn't want to go back and say to Abraham, well, I'm released from the oath because she didn't want to go or anything like that. He genuinely wants this to work out. So on one hand, he's got a streak of maybe realism. Some might call it negative. Well, what if she doesn't want to go? And yet at the same time, we find him pushing to finish this and finish it according to the will of Abraham. Now I think about us and think about the master that we serve and the mission that we have while we're here on earth to bring glory and honor to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a witness for him here and all around the world, to make disciples of those who are saved, to use our spiritual gifts in the body of Christ, to be salt and light in a decaying world. I mean, that's a big, big assignment. And when I think about it, maybe you could call it negative, but it's also realistic. I know not everybody's going to be excited about that. I know not everybody is going to just be gung-ho to hear what Greg has to say. I've got a word from God. Oh, do you? You know, good for you. And then they walk away and do their own business. Or they listen politely and they're kind but not interested and uh, just walk away. Or some may be downright hostile. It happens from time to time. But at the same time, what about all of the people throughout the life and the years that I've been in the ministry who responded positively? And sometimes I was a little surprised by that. I was in Honduras and uh, they had a medical and dental team that was there to work. They had all kinds of uh, eye doctors and they had regular 
uh, MDs and they had uh, dentists and all kinds of things there, all set up and pharmacists. And it was really quite impressive. We were in a little village in the mountains of Honduras. They helicoptered us up there. And uh, whenever the people would come, they would come and uh, there were five of us that were pastors and they would have to listen to us share the gospel before they could go see the doctors. And I remember uh, near the end of the week, I uh, preached to them and then asked them how many of them would like to trust the Lord and commit their lives to Him. And I was amazed at the number of people that stood up. And in my mind, what happened? Kind of like Eliezer. Well, this can't be right. And so I had them sit down. And so I said, you know, if you uh, do this, you'll be kicked out of the Catholic church that was there. Your families might reject you. It may make life, make life really, really difficult on you. This is not an easy thing. Jesus said we are to count the cost and uh, made it harder. And they stood up again. And I thought, well, this is, you know, uh, big faith Greg here. Uh, this can't be right. And so I had them sit down again and I said, now if you're thinking that if you respond to this, you'll see the doctor quicker, you won't because we're going to have some people talk to you and other people will go see the doctors before you do. Now how many of you want to trust the Lord? More stood up. I was just dumbfounded by all of that. Uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. And uh, yet at the same time, had you asked me, do you believe in the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God, the power of the gospel, all of that? Yes, I do. I believe God is sovereign. I believe he's got it all set up and I believe he's going to save people as he has chosen them. Yet at the same time, there was that part of me that said, it can't be this easy. Because I've had experiences before where I went out believing the same thing and people just basically slam the door in my face. We've all had those kind of things happen. I've had that happen to where with a family gathering or something, it just sort of shut everything down and it was obvious that was not a welcome word. Maybe it wasn't a good time. Maybe I, I, I missed that boat, but I don't know. But it just kind of shut it all down. But in this situation, it seemed like the door just was flung open and uh, people responded to all of that. And uh, it, like Eliezer, I was just a little bit, you know, wow, this is great. Man, I didn't expect this, okay? Now, that's not exactly what we're talking about here, but it's uh, pretty close. So Eliezer, can you imagine after he eats and after they go to bed and he gets up the next morning, he's ready to go home. He is excited about what he's been able to do for his master. So he's ready to go. Pack the camels. Let's, uh, let's get, get headed back, okay? And then just what he thought was going to happen, happened. Now we find that we've got family members saying, you know, uh, this, is, this whole thing is great, and we're sure glad you came, and man, God has really been good to you, but let's not do it now. Now, can you imagine being in Eliezer's shoes? I thought this was a little too easy. I thought this was a little too good to be true. So what are you really wanting here? Are you calling the whole thing off? No, we're not really calling it off. We're just saying, wait. Now, as you think about the story and the times in which they lived, they only wanted a few days, maybe, maybe 10 days, right? That's not all that long in the whole scheme of things. But then again, maybe it is when you think about the fact that uh, how is she going to know where to go exactly? And uh, what kind of dangers are lurking in the desert on, on a trip like that? I mean, anything could happen. Wild beasts, thieves, robbers, who knows? They could end up, you know, in a completely different place. I always think about uh, Christopher Columbus thinking he was going to India and he discovers the Americas, right? And uh, that's why he called the natives there Indians because he thought he was in India. I mean, you can get blown off course. You can be in a different place. Even the pilgrims, when they came and uh, were finding the place where they were going to settle, they 
kind of got blown off course and ended up in a different place than they intended. Travel was very difficult and imprecise in those days. And so uh, maybe they're thinking if we can just keep her here, we can talk some sense into her head. She uh, will think about it. How much is she going to miss her father and her brother and her mother? How much she's going to miss life here? How different it's going to be there? We don't know what it's going to be like there. And uh, she'll just decide not to go. So Eliezer is probably thinking that same thing. Well, if she doesn't go now, then uh, she'll probably never come. And that kind of is what I'm thinking. And that seems to be the way that it really looks. Can you, can you see that? So the servant wants to finish well. And that's why he kind of pushes just a little bit. They ate and drank. They stayed all night. They arose in the morning. Send me away. They're very polite, very respectful. And uh, using these good manners, they had experienced incredible hospitality here. These people did not have to lodge them. They didn't have to feed them. They didn't have to be kind to them. They could have just sent them away. So Eliezer is not deterred by any of that. I mean, maybe Eliezer could say, you know, this is a nice place. I'll just stay here and, uh, you know, forget about Abraham, hang him. But it's the desire of a good servant to complete his assignment. I think about Jesus just before he went to the cross in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. It says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. That's why he went to the cross, by the way, to glorify his father. Verse 2, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That's the doctrine of election there. Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now look at this. I have, past tense, glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. See the desire of the servant, Jesus, to finish everything that God has planned for him to do. That's the way we ought to be. We ought to be looking around and thinking as we read the Bible of the unfinished task of reaching the lost, of being out in the field of harvest, of being disciple makers and carrying the gospel and supporting the carrying of the gospel all around the world. That ought to be the heartbeat of every believer, finishing and finishing well. Luke chapter 2, 19 and 20. We find a guy that sees Jesus as a little baby and he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And God had promised him he would not die until he saw the Messiah. Now it's there. He's ready to be dismissed in peace. God's finished the work. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. The apostle Paul is in prison. This time he's not getting out. And he said, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. It's here. I have fought the good fight. And look at this. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. So you see the theme, servants, good servants, Good stewards want to do their master's will. They want to finish and they want to finish well. We don't want to just run out of time. You know, it's so unsatisfying if you're watching a football game and your team has the ball. They just need a score to win. And yet they keep eating up time and you're watching the timer get closer and closer to the zeros. And uh, while they're still on the field, before they can score, the time runs out. Isn't that a 
terrible feeling. And yet so many people will live their lives just like that. We all are on a countdown timer. And the idea is how do we spend our time? How do we use our time? What are we doing? Are we going to finish? And are we going to finish well? I, I mean, I guess we would say we're all going to finish because all of us are going to die or the Lord's going to return. But will we be found faithful and will we have finished the work that God has called us to do? That's the idea in the first point. Number two, notice the resistance of the family. And uh, when I look at this again from a human natural standpoint, I understand this. Uh, Rebecca's betrothal was good and bad news, right? And so the delay makes the trip more dangerous and more difficult. All of those things we talked about before, navigation, theft, some type of attack. She might be kidnapped. She's a beautiful woman. And so when we uh, look at the whole situation here, I think what they are hoping for is that she'll change her mind and just stay back. That's natural. It's hard to give up a child. It's hard to give a bride away. It's difficult. You, some of you daddies who have done that, you know exactly what I mean by that. So this is an attack, not a, not a hostile attack. It, the, there doesn't seem to be any hostility here. Just what harm could there be in waiting just a few days, a week, 10 days, something like that. And yet it's an attack on the covenant that God made with Abraham and the sovereignty of God. This is the will of God. Yeah, well, we don't want to do that. And um, so think about it. No one overrules God. This is the confidence that we have, even in the upcoming elections that we have in November. No one overrules God, not even the American electorate, not you or me. Uh, God's will is done. Daniel chapter 4 uh, says this in verse uh, 34 and 35. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven... And my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. Now look at his description of God. I wish more Christians understood this. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. By the way, that doesn't mean he doesn't care. It just simply means they are powerless compared to him. And it says he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? He doesn't have to explain himself to anyone. I mean, this is a fabulous story and a great thing to remember. So how is this all going to work out? Now, number three, the servant remains focused upon his ultimate master. He doesn't freak out. He doesn't bend to the will of the people that he's around. He is still serving Father Abraham. And by so doing, he's serving God, the sovereign of the universe. So he says to them, do not hinder me since the Lord has prospered my way. In other words, if this is the will of God, like you said, and you can see the hand of God in all of this, why are you getting in the way? I've got to go back, go back to my master. So the clear and acknowledged providence of God meant that uh, to oppose the servant was to oppose God. And we find ourselves so many times we kind of get in the way of the providence of God and we get run over like a steamroller, don't we? And uh, we need to learn to go with God instead of constantly opposing God. And some of our ideas and thoughts about prayer is almost like God can be manipulated by my words into changing his mind. But remember, he's an all-knowing God. He does not change. He is immutable. And so God is going to do what God is going to do. I need to get lined up with him, with his will and his providence. This is going to happen. And so the mission was about pleasing God rather than making Laban happy or making Rebecca's mother happy or anything like that. This is about the will of God. 
And so anyone can feel for Rebecca's family. We don't deny that in this situation. In uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 26, uh, actually verse, verse 25 here, it says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he uh, turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not, listen to this, hate his father and his mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Simply saying this, that our love for Christ and our commitment to Christ has to be greater than anything here on this earth. It needs to be that we love Jesus so much that it appears we hate our own parents. We don't, of course, but our commitment to Christ is that much greater than it is to anyone else. But people today make idols out of family. Well, family has to come first, not according to Jesus. And uh, we think about how difficult this is. Now, is that an easy thing to do? Oh, I'm saved. I don't care what my parents think. No, it's not. And uh, we, we think about what he is demanding here. This is one of the hard sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't mince words and he meant everything that he said. And our commitment to him has to supersede everything else in our life even to the point of denying our own life, taking up our cross and following him, willing to die for him. And that brings us to point number four. Rebecca's willingness is not surprising, even though it may actually be surprising, right? I mean, if you were looking at this, again, from a human standpoint, you would be thinking, uh-oh, here's where it unravels. They're going to ask her and she's going to agree with the parents and we're never going to hear from her again. But surprisingly, she says yes. Surprisingly, they say, will you go with him? Uh, yeah, I'll go. And so this is the ongoing work of God and his providence to provide a wife for Isaac so that they can have children and they will be children of the covenant. So it's an unusual situation for women at the time. In the uh, times that we're talking about now, usually they didn't even ask the woman's opinion. But I think this was not so much, oh, we believe in equal rights or something like that. I don't think we can go that far on this. I think Laban and the mother are simply thinking, well, she'll see things our way and her heart will be toward us. And this is the way we're going to get out of this. So we don't have to be the bad guys. We don't have to be the covenant breakers. We can say, well, you know, she's just not really willing to go and all of that. So I think they were surprised by this. And I think maybe Eliezer was surprised too. It didn't unravel. So humanly speaking, everything seemed to be kind of up in the air, but from God's perspective, it was settled and under control. Psalm 110.3 says, Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Uh, the King James puts it this way, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In other words, a volunteer is agreeable. A volunteer says, yeah, I'll do it. And uh, this is what is happening here. The people uh, here being Rebecca are willing because this is the power and the providence of God. The ESV puts it this way. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. And that's what Rebecca did. Praise chance, right? I mean, this, this whole thing is rigged, but at the same time, it didn't look rigged. It looked like it was unraveling. <clears throat> pardon me, and yet it was not. So this is an interesting thing. Praise the name of the Lord our God, right? Your people will volunteer freely on the day of your power, according to the New American Standard. So all of this has come together, and all of it's working. There's a threat. There looks like a glitch. It looks like there's a hiccup in this thing, but God knew all about that, and the provision is already made. Rebecca's heart is already turned toward Abraham and Isaac. And so uh, she's going to go. 
And how many times have, has it looked like things that you knew were the will of God seemed to kind of unravel? And then later on, maybe the timing was off or something like that. Just know that God does his will. And if it doesn't work out, it wasn't the will of God, right? So the conclusion is, number one, appreciation, respect, and honor to others is always appropriate for believers. May I be excused is what we talked about. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, love uses good manners. Number two, however, good manners do not mean softness, compromise, or an unclear course of action. Believers are not to be wobbly or fuzzy. We need to use bold colors, not pastels, as we live our lives and as we speak the truth, like Eliezer did. Number three, God allows opposition to his plan, or it wouldn't happen, but he allows it. It glorifies him. This is what complicates the story. This is what makes it all the more glorious, right? And number four, victory is never in doubt. Trust and rest in God. Sometimes we trust him, but we don't rest in him. We don't need to fret. Our God is in the heavens, the psalmist says, and he does whatever he pleases. This is all God carrying out his will and his covenant in a magnificent and wonderful way. So, encourage you to look at that application and think about how that works in your day-to-day -day life. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for those of you who teach. Thank you for those of you who watch this to keep up with what we're doing. May the Lord bless you. And we certainly will see you next week as we continue this series.